our responsibility as believers uh, in missions. But Lord, beyond just that challenge, we pray that the Word of God would have free course in these moments. There could be some today who do not know the Lord Jesus and need to see their need. There could be a Christian who needs to be encouraged in maybe some other area. So we pray the Spirit of God would take the truth and challenge us, draw us closer to you, exalt the Lord Jesus, and we thank you for what you'll do in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to read the text in Matthew chapter 9, if you'll notice down in verse 35, that Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. You know, when I was in school, my job for the first couple of years I was there to help work my way through school was to work on the stage crew. Now, a lot of the time we spent building sets for plays. They did Shakespearean plays and operas, and they would put those on, and of course we would build the set. And then we also had to work behind that when they drop the drapes and you know one set moves and you put the other one in to, to kind of move things around and drop the little screens and all of that. So I worked all of those productions uh, for the Shakespearean plays, uh, the operas. I've seen, uh, I know Rigoletto, I think I saw it 14 times. Boy, that was a blessing. Uh, but <laughs> I, I've seen all of these different operas and plays. And of course, we would sit backstage waiting for our opportunity. They dropped the uh, drape and we would come in and we'd shift things in place. I remember one particular opera, I don't remember which one it was, but I remember they did it and it was an elaborate set. I mean, just all kinds of stuff that we had built, uh, different things that would come down, huge things with wheels on them and you had to push it in place. And so one day they had finished all the sets and they said, let's set up for this scene. We set the scene up, uh, 10 or 15 of us, and it probably took us 20 minutes just to shift everything in place and to get it ready. And it was a lot of stuff. And so we began to talk about how the production was going to take place. And so the guy came in and he said, this has got to be changed. And if I remember correctly, it was like in two minutes. And we're looking at all of this stuff that we just pushed. It took us 20 minutes to drag it in place. And of course, you had to store it somewhere off stage uh, in the meantime. And we had this conversation. We're like, well, that's just not, there's no way. I mean, we can't get all of that stuff in place in two minutes. Now, there was a man who had worked at that uh, stage. In fact, he built the stage. He got it from New York somewhere and brought it down and, and reassembled it. Uh, his name was um, uh, Mr. Stratton. And Mr. Stratton had been there for years. And when he, we told him what the challenge was, he didn't get upset. He didn't panic. He said, okay, you tell us the time and we'll figure out how to do it. Now, I don't know how he did it. But he, we came in one day, of course, doing the dress rehearsal, and he told us to put this particular place over here, put this one here, put this, you know, all the places they were going to sit. You three guys will handle that. You two are going to handle this. You're going to take care of that. And if you just do your job, when you do what you're supposed to do, it'll come together. We did it for the first dress rehearsal and got it done in about, I don't know, three minutes. So we knew we were close. We did it in the next, uh, I think we had to do the production three times. And so the first time we did it, we hit the two minutes. Do you know, by the time we got done, we put that whole thing in, in just like a minute and had it set up. We went from 20 minutes to a minute. Now, I didn't know how we were going to do that. The people didn't know how we were going to do that. Mr. Stratton knew how to do that. He was in charge and he got it done. Do you know when I look at the great commission that God gives to the church, and I think that we're not just responsible to reach our neighbor, though we're responsible to reach our neighbor. He didn't tell us just to uh, reach somebody that enjoys church or um, some folks that have a religious background. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Frankly, that's overwhelming. I mean, he didn't say, I'm just holding a few of you. He said, the whole church... Here's your job, and you might look and say, well, there's just no way that's going to happen. But that's when we overlook the Lord of the harvest. You see, he's the one that's over it, not us. And if I look at it and say, well, if I just do my job, I can't reach everybody, but I can reach somebody. 
I can't go everywhere, but perhaps I can send somebody else. I can't do all the job, but I can meet my responsibility. And then what we do is we take that and leave it in the hands of the Lord of the harvest. Now, when I read this passage, I notice that Jesus' emphasis was just that. You know, the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, it says, God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think about sometimes giving out a gospel tract to a person, a little fear enters my heart. When I think about talking to a relative that I know well, but I know they're lost, I can get a little fear. Uh, as a pastor, when I look and see, well, we've got a bunch of missionaries to support, and boy, if it was just up to us, I might have a little bit of fear. But God didn't give us the spirit of fear. He gave us power, love, and a sound mind. It is not a coincidence that when I read this passage in verse 35, I am impressed that he went about teaching and preaching, healing every sickness and every disease. That reminds me of his power. When I look in verse 36 and he saw the multitudes and he was moved with compassion, it reminds me of his love. And then when I look down at verse 37 and verse 38 and realize that the disciples evidently had a misunderstanding and he corrects it, it reminds me that I need a sound mind. Now, I want to consider this morning, when I think about the Lord of the harvest, why is it that I can trust him? Why can I just expect him to do this? Well, I see it in this passage, and we're going to move through it fairly quickly. But I want you to notice, and we're going to start backwards in verse 37 and verse 38. When we think about a sound mind, what do we think? The disciples evidently looked at this and said, these people don't want Jesus. They're not interested. This is pretty much over. The Pharisees aren't listening. The, the rulers don't want to. In fact, if they just stuck around for a while, Jesus is going to be put on a cross. But that wasn't the end. That was the beginning. He said, I don't see a world that is rejecting me and there's no hope. He said, I see a world that is rejecting, which means there's a great opportunity. The Lord of the harvest. So when I consider, first of all, the Lord of the harvest, let's consider the program. Now, God has, if I can use a human term, a superior program. Man's programs fail. God's never does. You could call it a plan. Uh, he has a way that it's accomplished, and it's the right way. And he says it starts with a recognition. He says, truly, the harvest is plenteous. Now, the devil would love to confuse me and give me the impression that the harvest is not plenteous. Jesus looked at uh, when he was in Samaria in chapter 4 in the book of John. He said to his disciples, they're, they're looking, what in the world is he talking to this woman by a well for? Uh, Samaria, they can look at them as just as, as uh, people they would have nothing to do with at all. But he said, say not ye, there are four months, then come at the harvest. I say unto you, look on the fields, for they are white already unto harvest. Now, they looked at it like there was nothing to harvest. Jesus said, you're missing it. There is plenteous white fields to be harvested. You know, when we listen to the media and we hear people tell us about the degradation of our culture, and it is degraded, our culture has some real issues. When we hear people making a big case why it's okay for them to uh, kill an unborn baby, when we hear them make a case for redefining what marriage is, when we hear people taking what really is just not a, a mixture of sin and mental illness that a person thinks they're uh, born one gender and they can just decide by a whim that they can be another, we, man, this is outrageous. How can this be? This world must almost just be done. There's no hope for it. You're right. There would not be any hope for it except for the Lord Jesus Christ. When we, in our human thinking, look at that, we say, well, things are so dark what hope do we have? Jesus says, well, the darker it gets, the wider the harvest. There's great opportunity. Here we think about a missionary going over to a place like Japan. or uh, What are they going to do in Japan? Man, there's a bunch of folks over there. They're Buddhist. They worship their ancestors. They've got their own religion. What are they going to care about a Christian religion? You might get lucky and find one or two people that will listen to you. That's how man views it. What about a Muslim nation? You know, these people, they have the Koran, they're stuck, uh, they have terrorism as their roots and so forth. What hope is there? That's how man views it. But when you consider the Lord of the harvest, the one who's over this thing, the one who saves people, the one who sent his son to die for sinners, says actually the opposite is true. The harvest is plenteous. You know, the devil's a great deceiver, isn't he? I mean, the devil 
would love to talk you into thinking there's no hope. How are we going to reach this world? But you know what? If I don't listen to him, God's given me the spirit of a sound mind, and I can say, wait a minute. If he said the harvest is plenteous, there must be something to that. Now, I uh, tell you, I've got very limited experience when it comes to harvesting. I did pick cucumbers when I was a kid because I had to. Um, and that was pretty lucrative. I think I made a buck 75 a couple of times when I was out there filling these bags up. But, you know, we were taught you go through, and if they're too small, don't pull them. You know, if they're too big, you can pull them, but don't put them in your bag because we don't want them. I guess they were to make pickles and so forth. Yeah, I had to overlook some of them. Some of them I did say, oh, I missed that one. But, man, we got a bag full of those things. There was more that were you were able to pull off than you had to reject. It was, it was ready to be harvested. Of course, there's going to be some folks that are going to say no to the gospel. Uh, to their detriment, to their eternal uh, separation from God, yes, folks will turn it down. But evidently, from what Jesus said, there's a whole lot of folks, if we just get to them, that are willing to receive it. The harvest is plenteous. He's got a great program. But you know, not only the recognition of the, the, that the harvest is plenteous, but what about the resources? He didn't say... In verse 37, since the harvest is plenteous, I mean, immediately my thought, if I'm a human being and I catch on to that truth, well, I need to get a whole lot busier. I need to do more. Man, I need to be added a whole lot. Now, we need to meet our responsibility, but it's not that a few people need to get at it more. We need more people to get at it. He didn't say, you disciples better work harder. He said, pray the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth more laborers into his harvest. Now, you know, just like I know God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, I know that God wants to save sinners more than I want them to be saved. Do you know we're still told, in, uh, for instance, in more than one place, but for instance, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, that I exhort, therefore, that first of all prayers, intercessions, uh, giving them thanks be made for all men, that they may come to the knowledge of the truth, I mean, why would God want me to pray for sinners if he says they're going to be saved? Because there's a spiritual battle, and that battle is won in prayer. God is pleased to answer prayer. Well, if God wants people to go out and reach people for Christ, he wants missionaries on the field, he wants uh, Christian workers out trying to do the work of the gospel, he wants Christians, why would I need to pray for it? Because there's a spiritual battle. And God says we're to ask the Lord to send laborers into his harvest. Now, there's a program. What a program it is. You know what God's program is? 2 Corinthians 4, 7, we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. You know, uh, God can save billionaires. Um, I can tell you several, uh, maybe one. Uh, I'm trying to think. Well, I believe he could anyway, possibly. Uh, he could save billionaires. For instance, the thought came to me the other day. You know, if God saved Elon Musk, all the churches in the whole, I'm talking about fundamental Bible preaching churches, if you took every one of their mission programs and added them all up, it wouldn't be 10% of his net worth. I mean, it wouldn't even be close. Could God save Elon Musk? He could, but don't get me wrong. He doesn't need Elon Musk's billions. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Now, you could look at it, if I were looking at it from a human standpoint, and I didn't have a sound mind, I'd say, you know, if God would just save a couple of these billionaires, even if he didn't save them, even if he did like Nebuchadnezzar and just used them as a, as a vessel before he even knew the Lord and said, look, this guy's lost, but I'm going to use his money in this particular way, he could fund all of the missionaries, he could do any kind of endeavor he wanted, God has access to that. Now, there's no question God could do it, and I don't have to know why. But actually, when I think about it, it makes sense the way God's doing it. Because when God does it through earthen vessels, the excellency of the power becomes, you mean them regular old folks, no special, not many mighty are called, not many noble, just regular old folks that love Jesus are able to reach the world with the gospel? That brings glory to God. I mean, he's got a program, so we've got the recognition. We know what God's resources are. His resources are his people. You know, God's the one that uses me to maybe be a blessing to my kids and reach them with the gospel. And then I might get a chance to reach out to a neighbor and reach him. 
uh, through my local church. We go to our, we're going to have our soul winning outreach with our baskets and our door to door and so forth. And we introduce the, sow the seed. Sometimes we have a blessing of leading people to Christ that way and whatever it might be. We're, we're meeting that need. But then as a local church, we say, well, you know, I can't go to Japan or the Ukraine or some of these places. But boy, if God would call somebody, maybe we can help them get there. And he uses the resources of the local church when we invest in eternity to the Lord of the harvest. Where where are we giving it to? We're not really giving it to the missionary. We're giving it to the Lord of the harvest. And then he distributes it and uses it as he will. Because, you know, just like the loaves and the fishes, he can multiply it. He can multiply what we give him. Now, he's got a program, and his program works. So what does it come down to? Our regard. We've got to regard the Lord of the harvest. Psalm 127, verse 1, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. I hope you understand today, uh, we're not as a local church, I would never want to twist your arm, I would never want to pressure you, I would never want to say, boy, these missionaries are on the field, and if you guys don't come through, we're going to have to bring them home. No, if God wants them on the field, he doesn't need me or you, but I sure would like to be part of what he's doing. I want to participate. I've got to remember the Lord of the harvest. Hey, when it comes down to our church, we look out in the community and we think, well, man, there's a, you know, there's a lot of places that aren't really preaching the Bible, but they offer a whole lot of entertainment and uh, have all kinds of stuff that maybe we can pick. We're not in competition. We're simply yielded to the Lord of the harvest that we could reach people with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, that's our job. We've got to regard him. We've got to know that he does the work. So if we have a sound mind, we know the Lord of the harvest is over this thing, I'm first, see his program. But then look, if you would, back as it begins in verse 35. Because I can't overlook this. This is so evident. Is his power. The power of the Lord of the harvest. Now, he says in verse 35, Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. That was first. Well, then he verified it by healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Now, Jesus needed to do this, of course, to the Jew. It was prophesied in Isaiah 61. Uh, When he stood in the temple in Luke chapter 4, he read Isaiah 61, and he said, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. The Lord hath anointed me to preach the gospel and to heal the sick and to open the eyes of the blind and so forth. Jesus came to demonstrate he was truly the Christ by his miracles. But his miracles verified his message. He preached, he taught, and then demonstrated, yes. Now, today, we don't need the physical miracle. We've got the power of the Word of God. We've got 2,000 years of history. We've got changed lives. We see the work of God. But I want you to know his power is just as real. His power hadn't changed. His power is still unlimited because he's all-powerful. Now, I want you to consider for a moment the power of When he preached this, there's a couple of things that took place. Do you know when the power of the Lord and the Lord of the harvest, his power is evident, when it's there, it invites. You notice it says when he saw in verse 36, the multitudes, a bunch of folks came to hear Jesus. Why? Because there were such godly people? Well, a bunch of these are going to yell crucify him. No, something drew them. And you know, people still are drawn to the truth. Now, their heart repels it. Our our default position is to say no to it. But there's something interesting. There's something compelling. There's something about it. People don't even know why, but the truth draws. Jesus said in John 12, 32, uh, 32, And I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto myself. See, the truth is going to draw. The power of God, a person can't put their finger on it. They don't know what's happened. Uh, Perhaps they don't even want God, but they know there's something about it. They're enamored because they're missing something on the inside. But you know, it also reproves. I look back at verse 34. It says, the Pharisee said, he cast out devils through the prince of the devils. I, I, I can't deny his power. I mean, clearly he's cast out devils. He's healed people. He's done all this stuff, but he must have done that by the power of the devil. Well, now... That wouldn't make any sense if the devil's going in to destroy these people. Why would God, or why would the devil rather, give somebody power to stop what he had done? Of course, that didn't make any sense. And the world doesn't make any sense when they try to combat what God is doing through the gospel. Everywhere it goes, the world is better. But his power was evident. 
I want you to look quickly, if you would, back to chapter 8. Just back up to chapter 8 in the book of Matthew. I want you to notice the power of God not only invites people, but it impacts. Now, before he made this statement in chapter 9 of the book of Matthew, in chapter 8, we have numerous examples of his power. Now, notice how Jesus demonstrates his power. And you understand this isn't all the miracles of Jesus. This is a small sampling. But just before he said this statement in Matthew 9 about the Lord of the harvest, here's what they had seen. In chapter 8, look down, if you would, to verse 2. And it says, Behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Jesus put forth his hand, touched him, and said, I will, be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. We can't take time to elaborate on these fully, but you know leprosy was an uncurable disease. It was a disease of, uh, of the blood that would demonstrate itself on the outside. And in the Bible, it's a picture of sin. This man, of course, had, had leprosy. He had no hope. This internal disease that was destroying his life, uh, it, had, it brought him to a place where he knew he was going to be destroyed. He knew he had no hope. And he heard about Jesus. And he said, if you will, you could make me clean. Look, you might not know much about the Bible. You may not fully understand all the truths of what Jesus accomplished. You know he died. You know he came out of the grave. And you know he offers you an invitation. Do you realize if you just come to him today and say, Lord, if you, if you could, would, you would make me clean. You know what he's going to say? I will be thou clean. That tells me he's got authority over disease. And that's the disease of sin. I look a little bit further here and I notice in verse 6. A centurion comes to him and in verse 6 saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus said, well, I'll come and heal him. Now, if you know the story, the centurion says, well, don't come to my house. He said, I'm a centurion. I, if I want something done, I just tell a soldier to go do it and he does it. I sure believe you got more power than I do. And Jesus marveled. He said, boy, I hadn't seen so great a faith in any Israelite as I have this Gentile. But if you look a little bit further down, you'll notice in verse 13, Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. Now here a centurion is at some geographical location. He meets Jesus and he says, You know, I've got a servant that's sick, and I really like this servant. He's been a great servant, and I'd like you to heal him. Jesus said, Well, let's go, because Jesus already knew what was in this man's heart. He said, well, I don't need you to come to my house. I'm not worthy for you to do that. But if you'll just speak the word, he'll be healed. This man recognized Jesus had authority to heal people over distance. Now, that kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Because he is everywhere. But you know, there's folks we'll never see that get saved by the same gospel that we get saved by at a great distance. Well, you know, you go down to the next passage, and you'll notice in verse 15, Peter's uh, mother-in-law, his wife's mother, uh, lay sick of a fever. Peter did everything he could to talk Jesus from coming, but she came anyway. And No, I'm just kidding. No. Verse 15, he touched her hand, and the fever left her. She arose and ministered unto them. When the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out spirit with his word and healed all that were sick. You know, here this woman has a, has a, a fever. It's not going to take her life necessarily, but it's causing her a real problem. Uh, it may have been something ongoing. They didn't have doctors, of course, to be able to help her in any way. But when Jesus shows up, he didn't just give her an aspirin and say, call me in the morning. Jesus came in, and immediately the fever left her. You understand, Jesus has authority to handle debilitation. There's a lot of things in our life that are debilitating, aren't they? You know, sin debilitates a person's life. We'd like to have everything figured out. I got a good job. I got a nice place to live. I got some kids. But I'll tell you what, problems are coming. The troubles are coming because sin brings trouble. I'm not saying it's just because you're a thief or a liar or a cheat that all of a sudden you're getting paid back. That's true as well. But there's sin in this world. There are debilitating things in this world. And I'm telling you, Jesus doesn't just give us a, a little help up. He changes our life completely. They saw it take place. Immediately, her fever left. Well, then you'll notice uh, in, down a little bit further in verse 23. When he was entering into a ship, his disciples f followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. 
Now, down in verse 26, he saith unto them, after they wake him up and ask him to, to cure it, Why are you so fearful, O ye of little faith? He arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. The men marveled. What manner of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? You know, that's a good question, isn't it? What manner of man is this that even the winds and sea obey him? You know, that tells me that he has authority over devastation. There's some devastating things that take place in a life. I mean, there's some things that we face that we don't know how we're going to face. And yes, the ship was even overtaken. They just believed their life was at stake. And they woke him up. And you know the well-known phrase, carest thou not that we perish. And he says, well, what'd you think? I'm on the ship. If I'm on the ship and I said we're going to the other side, you can count on it, we are. And he spoke, peace, be still. Now, there's nobody on this earth that can speak to the ocean and cause it to go to peace. But I'm going to tell you something even more difficult. There is not a doctor, philosopher, theologian, religious leader, church, religious organization that can speak peace to your soul and make it have peace. But Jesus can. And there's people that have testified, I've tried this, I've gone to New Age, I've tried yoga, uh, I've tried uh, uh, Buddhism, I've tried uh, Confuciusism, I've tried atheism, I've tried every ism, schism, and spasm, and I couldn't find anything. But then very simply, in my, I didn't even understand the whole thing, but I heard that call from Jesus, and I said, yes. Now, did I have problems after that? Sure, some problems arose. Did I still have some things to learn? Sure, did I have some struggles? But one thing that I had, I had never had, peace. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He can give peace. He can overcome devastation. Well, we notice in uh, this same chapter, in chapter 8, in verse 28, when he's come to the other side of the country of the Gergesenes, that he met him too possessed with devils, coming out of the tombs, exceeding fierce, so that no man might pass by that way. And they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Are thou come hither to torment us before the time? Well, as the story goes on, of course, uh, those demons are cast out. You have to turn over, and I'm not going to take time to do it, but over in the book of Mark, in chapter 5, after they were cast out, the people of the city heard about it. They couldn't believe it. These people have caused us nothing but trouble. Uh, They... uh, have given us constant problems. They're, they're, they break the chains we put on them. They scare everybody who tries to show up. Uh, there's no way we can help them. They had tried to stick them out in the caves, just try to get rid of them. And somebody came into town and said, you ain't going to believe this. Those men that were out there are sitting, clothed, and in their right mind. The people said, I can't believe it. There's no way. And you know what the city did? They said, will you please leave and get away from us? You say, well, boy, that's unusual. And yet, what do we do? The gospel goes in, uh, makes drunk sober, harlots pure. Uh, The the jails would have a whole lot less population. School shootings, all of this stuff that they try to handle by the symptoms, we get to the heart. And when the gospel goes, people get changed and cleaned up. And the society says, man, will you quit trying to change people like that? Because they're... They don't understand that God is over this thing. The Lord of the harvest, his power. Uh, man, man's heart is to turn it down, but when you receive it, when you get on the other side and he comes in and gives you the peace that passes all understanding, then you ask yourself, how could I have not received this before? I mean, he demonstrates his power again and again, shows it to them. And then, of course, in verse chapter 9, as it continues, he's still demonstrating his power. It says in verse 2, Behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed, and Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. They didn't like that. So he asked in verse 5, Whether is it easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sin. Then saith he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go to thy house. And he arose, and he went to his house. Because, you know, I've told you Jesus has authority over disease and distance and debilitation and devastation and demons. But let me tell you what Jesus has authority over, depravity. 
Now, this man didn't just happen to have a problem. Some people do. Uh, John chapter 9, man born blind. Jesus said that wasn't any, had nothing to do with anything he ever did. But this man, his sin came directly as a result of his depravity. I don't know what he did. But the Bible says in Galatians 6, 7, and 8, Be not deceived, God's not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. I don't know if this man as a teenager decided, you know, I sure would like to see what it's like to get high. Somebody got him some weed. Maybe he started taking that and it wasn't enough. And then he went to cocaine and then meth and then shooting up something in his veins. I don't know what, what happened. I don't know if maybe he said, well, I don't want to go that far, but I'll try the alcohol. And he started out with just a little social drink. Before he knew it, he became a sot. And it began to destroy his liver, destroy his body, put him where he couldn't even walk, and they had to care. I don't know. Maybe it was immorality and some type of disease gave him uh, some type of an inability to walk. I don't know if maybe he had been in an armed robbery and somebody hit him and broke his leg. I mean, the Bible doesn't say, but whatever it was, his sin was directly related. You say, well, Jesus isn't going to help him, is he? He's just as interested in helping him because he has a cure for depravity. What's that cure? The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. Do you know that I am a Christian? Jesus lives in my heart, and he has entrusted me. Paul said he counted me faithful, entrusting the gospel to me. I have, and I can't do it, but I am a leg, if I can use that word, or an arm, or an extension of the Lord of the harvest that has power to help any sinner in whatever state they're in. Now, when he went around preaching and then he verified his miracles, hey, people said, something's going on here. Well, then not only his program and his power, but I want you to notice lastly, the picture. He gives us a picture. He says, when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them. Why? Because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. You know, that description is a woeful Description. I mean, shepherdless sheep. You know, sheep have to have direction. They have to have a shepherd. They can eat grass and they can move around, but when it comes down to it, they need to follow something. And he says, I look out at these multitudes. They think they know what they're doing. I mean, they they think they got life by a string. They don't even know it. They're like a, a dumb sheep who's just walking out thinking, well, I can get by. I'll just keep eating the grass until they run into a wolf. Or run off the edge. I mean, they literally would eat grass and walk right off the edge of a cliff and fall. And Jesus looked at the human race and he said, that's what they look like. He didn't look at the human race and said, that bunch of idiots, just let them walk. He was moved with compassion. He thought, isn't that terrible? They hate me. They reject me. The very thing that would, would I, I could save them. And he said, how often I would have gathered you together as a hen gathered a brood. And you would not. You will not come to me that you might have life. And yet he didn't look at that. And even to look beyond that and say, this same crowd is going to put me on the cross. But yet he came and he died for those very people. Now they were bad. But you know, we put him on the cross too. We're just as bad. It only took one lie for you to ever utter to offend a holy God. One dirty thought to ever cross your brain, you're separated from him. As a small child, the first rebellion that ever came out of your heart demonstrated your depravity, where you were, and God looked down at us and said, those are shepherdless sheep. A woeful description. Sin destroys people. We're destitute. But you understand that as far gone as we are, there's a deliverance. 2 Corinthians 5.21, he who knew no sin, that's Jesus, was made sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. A preacher of a large church, a big congregation, he told this story later, but he you know, felt successful. He had a large, uh, uh, well-known church in a, in a big city, and his name was sort of well thought of. The church certainly wasn't a, a, what you'd call a really sound Bible-preaching church, but it was a, a very well-known social-oriented type church, and a lot of folks came to it. One night, a little girl came to him, Pretty young, knocked on the door, and it was actually not even good weather. And she had made her way to this preacher's door, found out where he lived. He opened it up and saw this little girl standing out here almost dark, raining. What do you need, uh, dear? Well, my mother is sick, and I believe she's going to die. And she told me to come find you. 
She said, you're the pastor of the biggest church in town, and she wants you. And she, this girl was obviously not very well off. She could tell the way she was dressed. She wants you to come and tell her how to get in. Somewhere she had heard that phrase, that get in was getting saved. So he, he, he was the first, I don't know, what am I, this middle of the night, surely this could wait. But this little face, I mean, it was longing. He felt so bad for her, a little kid. He thought, well, honey, how far away do you live? And it was not too far. He said, okay, well, let's just go. So they jumped in a car, ran down, and she took him to this little place, a very, um, very poor home. Um, he went in, and he began to perceive this woman had, had lived a pretty wicked life. But she was, sure enough, close to death. So he sits down by her bed, and, and she said, are you the preacher up there at that big church? Oh, yes, ma'am, that's, that's me. She said, well, I know I, I don't have much time, and I want to see if you could get me in. Well, he kind of knew what she was talking about, but he himself had never been in. I mean, he was just a liberal preacher. He didn't know the gospel. He just knew about the Bible, but he didn't really know what to tell her. I mean, it's fine. He could get up and, and preach some flowery sermon, but he didn't know how to tell this woman. So he started thinking, well, you know, She's just sick. She just needs to feel better about this. And if I could just tell her something to help her to relax and feel better about it. He didn't know what the, uh, being born again really meant. So he began to think about some verses that he might show her. It came to him that when he was a, 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 a boy, his, woman, his, his uh, mother was a Christian. He didn't understand it all at that time. But he, his mother had taught him some, some verses. And they came to his mind. John 3.16. He said, well... Ma'am, the Bible says, for God so loved the world, that's bound to mean you, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. He found himself just taking the words of that verse and say, well, you know, if you have Jesus, you're not going to perish, you're going to have everlasting life. Then he thought of another verse, 1 John 1, 7. He, um, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Ma'am, I don't, you don't even know what you've done, but you know the Bible tells us that everybody, even mine, their sin will be forgiven. Then another verse came to his mind. 2 Timothy 1, uh, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners. He thought that'd make her feel better, but then he started thinking, well, boy, I'm a sinner as well. Do you know that man sat there that day and she and he both got in. Now, you understand that message is so simple and yet so profound. So effective and yet so overlooked. And yet our job, yes, to share it around us. And then to take God and ask him to give more resources, more people. Let's get as much as we can and get that message everywhere it needs to go. It's not our responsibility to save anybody. We look to the Lord of the harvest to oversee it. We just need to do our part. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Heads are bowed, eyes are